for 60 years, McLaren has crafted some of the best cars in the world, including the Ultimate Series, the iconic F1, the powerful P1, the awe-inspiring Senna, and the captivating Elva are a vibrant palette of innovation. But does McLaren's legendary gallery still weave a tapestry as vivid and captivating as it once did? To answer that, we need to look at where McLaren are today with this, the Artura, the company's latest product. It's not part of the Ultimate Series, but it is arguably the company's most advanced car yet. 190,000 pounds worth of sophisticated hybrid muscle. And it ticks all the boxes, believe me. Sexy, wrapped up in this gorgeous bodywork, power for absolute days, loads of agility, and yet, still somehow cheaper than cars with similar technology from some of their rivals. Wow! The Artura is a fantastic achievement in many ways, but is it as good as it should be? Is the modern McLaren living up to the high standards of its past? To answer that, we need to rewind almost exactly 60 years to where it all began. The McLaren story, as far as road cars are concerned, begins in 1992 with the birth of a legend, the McLaren F1. The brainchild of Gordon Murray, it was created for a single purpose, to be the best road car on the planet, and it delivered. With its 6.1-litre naturally aspirated V12 engine and 1,100-kilogram curb weight, performance was staggering. With this, McLaren didn't simply build a sports car to compete with their rivals, they built an engineering milestone that put everything else to shame. On the 31st of March 1998, McLaren made history, taking the XP5 prototype F1 to VW's test track in Erelesian. Here, in the hands of Andy Wallace, they attempted to set the record for the fastest ever production road car. The F1 achieved a staggering 241 miles per hour, but it wasn't simply down to raw power. That performance came as a result of exotic materials and clever design. Formula One technology applied to a road car. The monocoque was identical to F1 cars of the early 90s. The body was an aerodynamic masterclass with a small frontal area, ground effect aerodynamics and active wings. And the materials were exotic. The recipe called for aluminium and magnesium suspension joints, carbon body panels, and given the extreme heat generated by the engine, the best heat reflecting material available, gold. Maybe the most memorable thing about the F1 was its central seating position with two passenger seats, one on either side. Your passenger's thighs effectively are your armrests, so you got to know them pretty intimately. On my left-hand side, I've got controls including a handbrake and controls for the stereo, including for adjusting the bass and the treble. And on the right-hand side, I've got a power button underneath a flap, a manual gear selector, and controls for the air conditioning system. Although neither the stereo nor the aircon were reportedly very good. I even have two rear view mirrors because if I had one in the middle, it would just mean I end up looking at myself the whole time. The F1 also had two large luggage areas, one on either side, which was virtually unheard of in this type of car. Not that cars like this had previously existed because the F1 was Genesis, arguably the world's first hypercar. But they didn't stop there, because in 2013, McLaren released the spiritual successor to the F1, another future classic, the P1. If you thought the F1 was clever, then this was virtually space age. In 2013, McLaren borrowed heavily from its expertise in the world of Formula One to bring us the P1. They moved away from that naturally aspirated V12 in favor of a twin turbocharged flat plane crank V8, but it wasn't alone. It also had a 179 horsepower electric motor that altogether gave the car access to a phenomenal 916 horsepower. 
The power is amazing, but the weight is something else. 1,500 kilograms. That's about as much as a Volkswagen Golf. It's about as much as a modern day Porsche 911, except this thing has double the power of a 911. So you can imagine how fast it is. That's exactly what I've been doing all of last night, thinking about the phenomenal performance that this car would bring. And now here I am in reality, it does not disappoint. Nor to 62, 2.8 seconds. Nor to 124, 6.8. And nought to 186 miles an hour in 16 and a half seconds. Wow. To go any faster on this track, even today, you'd need a Veyron at least. But cars like the Veyron weren't a patch on the P1 when it came to going around corners. And likewise, not many cars are a match for it when it comes to noise. It's such a thrilling car to drive, honestly. And a lot of that, bizarrely, is because of the sound. A lot of people might not expect a twin turbo V8 to sound anywhere near as good as the naturally aspirated V12 on the F1, but in this car, it's a big part of the experience. It's not about the exhaust by itself, it's about the symphony of the exhaust and the engine and the turbos. When you lift off, it just lets off this amazing whistle. Check this out. Oh, it's like a whip crack. Beautiful sound. Oh. It's just unbelievable to listen to. And when you combine it with that outstanding performance, it's such an engaging thing to drive. Not only are the brakes strong, but when you apply them hard, you can actually feel the ABS chattering away in the pedal, letting you know that you might be on the limits. It's just talking away at you constantly, letting you know that it's doing what you want and keeping you in the loop. The same goes for the steering, which is phenomenal. You'd expect a hypercar to be quite distant and vague, especially around the front end, but in this, you know exactly what the front axle's doing at all times. McLaren wasn't alone in creating a hybrid hypercar. Porsche's 918 Spyder went into production a month sooner in September 2013. Ferrari beat the Porsche to market with the LaFerrari by a matter of four months. But McLaren's approach was unique. It was the only one of the threesome that combined batteries you could plug in, rear-wheel drive, and an EV-only range of around seven miles. It was also regarded as the most thrilling and unhinged of the so-called Holy Trinity. What I find incredible is that McLaren could have taken this philosophy even further with bigger electric motors, bigger batteries, even more outrageous straight line performance. But in 2018, they didn't want evolution. They wanted revolution. This is the Senna. And for this car, McLaren did away with the P1's sleek lines and hybrid drivetrain and invoked the name of its most famous Grand Prix racing driver. It wasn't built for straight line speed. It was built to go faster around corners than any road car around any track. Happily, there are some corners about half a mile that way. Better get to them quickly then, hadn't I? Okay, engine start. Race mode. That is cool. Launch. Foot on brake, awaiting full throttle. Floor it, boost building, boost ready. Pray for me. Oh, here we go. Oh my God. Those numbers are climbing rapidly. 130, 150, 160, 170 miles an hour, 180 miles an hour. Oh, the brakes are good. <laughs> They're amazing. Right, send it into the first corner, see what happens. Hope it sticks. It's sticking. It's sticking. It's sticking like glue. The reason it sticks is very simple. It's not witchcraft. It's not because it uses magical tires or because McLaren made a deal with the devil. It sticks because it's the most aerodynamically advanced car ever built working essentially like a plane, only upside down and with wheels. You think that thing's got wings? 
Trust me, it's got nothing on the McLaren Senna. This has got more wings than your local KFC. And apparently it has to look this way, otherwise it just wouldn't be as fast. Whereas most supercars are full of smooth surfaces over the front, the McLaren Senna is very different. It's full of cuts and scoops and vents that allow McLaren to divert the air in exactly the places where they need it. For example, take these nostrils at the front. They help to feed air along the side of the car, through the wheel arches and out through the doors for use further downstream. There's also this enormous bucket at the front, for want of a better word, that helps to cool the radiator and the nose bridge that guides the air up onto a roof snorkel and onto the rear wing. Airflow is managed by active aero blades that open and close, adding or bleeding off downforce. Meanwhile, behind the huge side vents, there are a set of gurney flaps that direct air up and away from the deck lid. And this rear wing, which works in conjunction with that carbon fiber diffuser, for me, is definitely the star of the show. Not only in terms of the swan neck design, which looks great, but also in terms of its operation it can actually adjust angle to increase or decrease the amount of downforce you get in the corners and it can stand right up to act as an air brake. In fact, in theory, it can actually generate too much downforce. If it didn't lay down flat at high speeds, then at maximum velocity, the rear wing would actually generate more downforce than the center actually weighs. Which sounds cool, it might mean you could drive the thing upside down in a tunnel until you realize that the right way up, it would generate so much downforce, the wing would break, the tires would pop, the suspension would be destroyed, and the driver would be killed. And then there's the engine, which is a good one. Very good. Oh. And the numbers are outrageous. It uses a four litre twin turbocharged V8. God, the brakes are good. And the thing makes 800 horsepower. So it's quick. But the most impressive number is the downforce figure. 800 kilograms at 155 miles an hour. Absolutely outrageous. 120 miles an hour through these four corners. That is the quickest I've ever been through there. And it is absolutely, astonishingly fast. Bang on the brakes. I'm braking too early, that's how good the brakes are. Wow. Woo. And it's playful. It's got 40% more downforce than the P1, for goodness sake. And the other cool thing are these doors. You can actually not only hit your apexes, but see them at the same time. It's almost overwhelming this car, the amount of noise it makes. The engine sounds like it's inside the cabin with you. This is the most raw, visceral McLaren I've ever driven. I've heard people say that it's approachable, that it's a bit of a pussycat, but I don't know what they're talking about because this is an absolute savage, it's so physical. The only thing holding this car back are the tyres. These Trofeo R's, they are road tyres. So in the low speed corners, it handles like a road car. There is a little bit of understeer, especially if you get too confident on entry. But if you're patient through these corners here, short shift and then feed in the power. Line yourself up for a fast corner, chuck it in. It just sticks. And you can really feel that downforce, not only round corners, but also in a straight line. Once you hit about 155, the car starts to squat down. And you can feel the crosswinds affecting the downforce. <laughs> it's astonishing. Right, what's it like into Chicago? Can you play with it? Let's find out. Will the center throw shapes? All day long.
But having created that particular masterpiece, you might think that for its next car, McLaren would build on the learnings of the Senna and create something that strives to improve on what was arguably perfection. But no, in 2020, they decided to attempt a new masterpiece, a car with no roof, no windscreen, more power than the Senna, and no downforce to speak of. A car that was seemingly aimed at complete maniacs. This car is nuts. Vincent van Gogh said, I put my heart and my soul into my work and lost my mind in the process. And I pretty much guarantee you, that is exactly what happened to the boys and girls at McLaren. <laughs> so it still has that four litre twin turbocharged V8, but this time with 815 horsepower, which is even more than the Senna. How's it doing that? Well, mainly thanks to a new exhaust, Inconel with 3D printed titanium finishes and better radiators. So it's genuinely fast and it feels it because this thing doesn't even have a roof or windows ever. The standard Elva doesn't even come with a windscreen. Thankfully, this one does. It's like a caterham on crack. The Elva was inspired by the open top Group 7 sports cars developed by the company's founder, Bruce McLaren, in the 1960s, production of which was outsourced to Elva Cars of Sussex. But racing wasn't the intention with this car. This one is all about letting your hair down, enjoying the ride, and giggling like an absolute schoolchild in the process. I've never ever in my life driven a car like this. Jeez, what is happening? What is happening? How many hypercars are there where the manufacturers say, we don't care how fast it is, all we care about is that you scare yourself silly. I love that. I love this. And that brings us full circle. We know that McLaren in its 60th year have done some incredible things with the Ultimate Series, but if we're gonna ask ourselves, does this company still have what it takes after so many decades of performance cars, then it's the McLaren Artura that's gonna give us the answer. In its 60th year, McLaren has pinned its hopes on a new car, one that draws inspiration from those at the very beginning of its lineage, but also one that brings new ideas. For the Artura, they developed a brand new carbon fiber lightweight chassis. They stepped away from the V8s that have powered almost all McLarens since the F1 and returned to hybrid power. The beating heart of the Artura is a three liter twin turbocharged V6, mated up to a 7.4 kilo hour battery pack and an electric motor. And that gives it some amazing numbers, 680 PS and 720 Newton meters. <laughs> so it's quick. 0 to 62 in three seconds dead. 0 to 124 in 8.3 quarter mile in 10.7. Not bad for a rear wheel drive car and flat out 205. It is very quick. Okay, not Senna quick, not P1 quick. But what you gotta remember is that this is the baby McLaren. Those things cost well over a million. This is only 200,000 pounds. The way the Artura delivers its power is really clever as well. In most McLarens, you tend not to get full torque up until after around 4,000 RPM. I'm not saying it's boosty, but you do have to be patient. In this though, because the motor gives you torque in fill, 
when you're in these low speed corners and get on the power, there is instant torque. It's really clever the way it works. And then when the motor gets up into the power band, the two work together to give it savage acceleration. Right, what's it like for fun factor? Throw it into Chicago. The back slides out with almost zero provocation. It's a supercar, all right. And it's a hilarious one at that. Do I miss the V8? Yes. Does it look different enough to previous McLarens? No. And is it a tad over-engineered? Maybe. And to what end? What's the point of using batteries and an electric motor if it only makes 680 horsepower? The V8 in the Elva alone makes over 800. What I've got to keep telling myself is that this is the baby McLaren and it's more powerful than any of the other babies from Ferrari, Aston Martin or Lamborghini. There's more to come from this car. It's only going to get better. Like every single one of McLaren's Ultimate Series cars that came before it, the Artura breaks convention. It reminds us that innovation is in McLaren's DNA. This is a company that reimagines itself at every opportunity with groundbreaking new technology, record-breaking speed, and engineering that often provokes the rest of the industry to respond. For 60 years, McLaren has never stood still. Only time will tell whether the company can continue to paint vivid and captivating pictures on the dynamic tapestry that is the automotive world, but on the evidence of the last six decades, there are many more masterpieces still to come. Thank you.